So Chris, we did a we did a recording probably about two months ago when you, you explained all the kind of ins and outs of the 921 videos, uh, the 921 irons. And it appears that people quite enjoyed listening to you talk about the product. So I thought we'd touch base with you again. Yep. And maybe look at some of the questions people have had since the launch. A few reflections from you. We've got we've got a few guests on the line as well. So we've got um, Fred as always over in Sweden. Fred, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. And you've, right you've, here, ready to you've go. received some clubs from us now. You've actually got some kit to test? No, not yet. Yeah, I have. <laughs> I've got the clubs. Uh, I love them so far. And uh, I hit the hot metal 300 yards. So it's great. <laughs> <laughs> so we've That's got we've, a lot of times. <laughs> we've got Matt on the European Tour Workshop. So Matt, you're over at Wentworth at the moment? I am, yeah. Hiding away. So uh, I'm, I'm not... Uh, I'm not in a, a good video spot, but I'm uh, I'm here for some audio. So yeah, I'll jump in as and when. So tell, tell me, what's it like down at Wentworth this week, Matt? Uh, it's been very strange. It's been a very strange couple of days. Normally, obviously, Wentworth being the flagship event, it's it's very well attended. It's very busy. It's almost like a it almost has a a festival feel to it. Um, aside from being a golf event, uh, but this year it's been it's been very strange. You know, you're driving into the same spots and you're walking around the same area, but there's two percent of the uh, of the population where it, it was years gone by. So it's been uh, it's been odd, but the golf course looks great and it's a really strong field. So I think it'd be good viewing on TV if anything. And where's the workshop? Are you in your your normal spot, or is it is it is it COVID we were, precautions? Yeah. No, we were, we were. with The trucks themselves were spaced out a little bit more, but yeah, we were in our normal spot down the right. Um, but they, that being said, they've, they've literally just driven, driven past and they're uh, heading back to HQ. So done for the week here. Um, and yeah, it's just been a, a, a very strange week to what is normally a very, very positive and awesome week. But I still think it'd be good. It'd be good to watch on TV. And Jay, thanks for joining us for the first time. So just, I'm sure most people know you already, Jay, but... So you're a, a club fitter slash golf professional slash YouTuber. Which what do those two yeah, prefer? A busy man. <laughs> but, I mean, ever since um, lockdown finished in the UK, I have just been mentally busy, um, just with the influx of COVID golfers, and just because everyone wants to start playing golf again, and we're looking at new equipment, and obviously with Mizuno, bringing out new JPX nine two one has been as busy as ever. So um, yeah. I'm a jack of many trades at the moment. <laughs> well, th thanks for joining us. We, we, we've got you in because we know you like your, um, we like your, you know, you like your technology and you like to analyse performance. So you mm. see, you seem to be quite a nice little offset because I would say Matt, Matt definitely comes at it from a more artistic angle, and I'd say Fred probably sits somewhere in the middle. That, that seems to be the balance anyway. So we've got a nice, a nice span of viewpoints and opinions. So I'm going to take you back to where we kind of started last time, where we checked out last time, Chris. So we bottom right there was a, was a link to the video you did to us last time out. And we kind of left the conversation hanging over wedges, which was kind of the surprise of the bunch. Mm -hmm. what's, what's happened on the wedge front since that conversation? Because the ES21 does seem to be the product that's caught everybody sleeping a little bit. Yeah, I think what's, what's always fun about Mizuno is, I, I say it's fun, but everybody kind of knows what's coming from us. So I don't think we really shocked the world when we when 919 was followed by 921 but i think the es21 was something that was absolutely very different and unexpected from us and not only unexpected in that it doesn't necessarily look like our product from certain angles and stuff but unexpected because it was a technology that really hadn't been fully executed on as well as we did in the entire industry so you're totally right where you know it's when you're going through a presentation you may have let's call it 10 slides on each product, people relatively understand what's the next two are going to do, what's the next hot metal going to do, and even what's the next forge, even though it had some changes. But when we explain the wedge and what it does, there's so many questions and so much intrigue just because it's something different. So the demand that's been built up has been huge. And what I'll say is the initial forecast that was in has already increased. So I know we're, um, we're very excited about that and for people to put it in play and get it in their hands. So we're, we're close. Are you close to shipping on that one on the US yet, Chris? We're very close. I believe manufacturing is actually building some up this week. The first, the first big mass production build, I believe, is happening probably as we speak, meaning they'll likely leave, the, leave our warehouse sometime into this week or starting next week. 
So Matt, so it doesn't look like a tour type product, but have you had any experimentation with this with any of the players? We have, yeah. We built a uh, we built a uh, sixty this week for for Jazz Jazz Jana Watson on. <laughs> Um, he came on and, and he, he was funny. So he, he'd uh, he'd seen it online, he'd seen it on social media, and uh, and he said, "He's oh, can I can I can I check it out? Because it doesn't look as 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 Vosh says there. It doesn't look like your traditional um, uh, not uh, clean's the wrong word because it still looks clean, but it looks very different to what our iron set looked like." And he said, "Oh, can I have a look?" And he put it down, and he saw oh, that looks looks really smart. I like the idea behind it, and we. We put a, a slightly different grind on it. He had a he had a, a Vokey that we, we put a different grind to match that, uh, and he uh, he went away and tested it. And uh, yeah, we're still waiting. That was uh, about two and a half hours ago. So <laughs> he's uh, he's still uh, he's still testing it. But uh, yeah, yeah. Looks, I think uh, you were you had Scott Gregory in not too long ago as well, didn't you? I saw him hitting a few little pitch shots. Yeah, I mean to be fair, everyone that we've had in, everyone that we've um, we've uh, built other stuff for so whether it be you know irons or, or woods we've always kind of just you know what do you think of that give it a little uh, little look see what you think and and the majority have said oh you know I'd like give it a try because it is very unique it's a very different wedge and it's got a good story behind it a good factual story so all the uh, all the parts are in place and you can just go in and, and, and test it and see what you think but I know I noticed with Scott the one thing he did say was on those little short pitch shots that he was getting a lot of spin hitting those he was on the fringes over at um, Bearwood Lakes yeah, absolutely. Check no it out. Doubt. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and and you know the one thing I think with with the players that we deal with is is making sure that you can match or or create a, a bounce that they that they enjoy because that's so key when you're looking at wedges is is how the the wedge interacts with the turf whether it be uh, in the states obviously they've got slightly different grasses over there or or when they're when they're over here that's the the main challenge for us is to try and um, try and and, and make the players fall in love with the bounce that's for sure so fred, fred you've, you've experienced all those different turf conditions then between the states and um, sweden and all, all across your travels does it make a big difference i mean absolutely uh from what i've seen i've i've had the wedges in my hand but i haven't hit them yet they have a wider sole uh, plenty of bounce on it so for the majority of golfers who play in soft conditions a wider sole, sole and more bounce is definitely going to help them. Uh, not many golfers, I bet maybe in some places in the UK, maybe uh, the conditions are a little bit firmer, but I mean, 80% of the places I visited everywhere in the world had more softer conditions. So a wider sole, more bounce is for sure going to help players there. And the, probably the most common comment is on that logo, Chris. So we've had obviously the... <laughs> Common interpretation is that we stole that from BMW, but that wasn't the case. <laughs> no, no, that's and that's the uh, the logo for the center of gravity. When we're when we're working on anything in the CAD world, that's really just the the icon or what little look that always represents a center of gravity location. And for us to have something like that in the middle of an otherwise very clean looking wedge, yeah, the geometry is a little bit funky, but you know, in terms of the logo placement, the look, the cleanliness of it, it's there. And then there's that one little bit that just, it catches your eye and makes you kind of question what, what that is and why it's there. And we did that for a reason. So Jay, would, would you have had one of these in your hands yet? Um, literally just came today. Oh, nice. <laughs> this is quite magic. So, I mean, they are still in the wrappers as we speak in there. So as yet, I haven't had a chance to um, open them up, but they do look quite bulky from the back. But when you put them down in game position, you can't hardly see the bulk at all. And actually, I think it's because of the darker color. Um, it does actually look quite a nice compact uh, wedge shape. Um, I haven't had a chance yet to test them on quad. Um, I naturally gravitate slightly healy um so a t20 works quite nice for me but it'd be interesting to see when i get more people um hitting them to see how uh, their strike pattern works and how um the new balanced cg will work with them do you tend to find do you lean towards the prettier type product or the more functional type product where does your personality take you well, it depends. It comes to your strike pattern. Lucky enough, I hit the middle probably a bit more than uh, the general person, so I can have the more blingy look. Um, I'm a blade fan. I love my uh, my chrome. I used to love the MP4s and fives. So yeah, the MP20 blades, my choice. But um, again, when it comes to 
general custom fit and you have to go with what the consensus is when it comes to strike pattern. If someone hits all over the face, then there's no point them putting a, a 921 Tor or an MP20 blade in their hands. Is it sometimes difficult to talk people out of that? Uh, generally speaking, uh, no, because I, I, I found that necessarily when, when people come to somewhere where they're, they're looking for a certain level of expertise, they they kind of just like want to listen. And I mean, sometimes the biggest difficulty uh, is trying to get that interaction uh, both ways, having the communication both ways, because sometimes they're just they're looking for you to just tell them what to do all the time. And no, it's a custom fit is a two way thing. So I thought it would be an interesting place to start, rather than asking you guys about the products, I thought, I think sometimes the most telling thing when you launch a product is what you find in the bags of the Mizuno staff very soon afterwards. Oh, hold on, I've jumped the gun. I've got good news first though, Chris. So we were going to talk about <laughs> Eric Ahara. Before we got to your bag, which is equally interesting, um, Eric Ahara, our kind of star player in Japan. So back to that idea about artistic or functional, she kind mm. of caught us out a little a bit by throwing the hot metals in the bag before I went at the weekend. Not even the pros. Not even the pros. No, admittedly, I was the one that made the mistake of posting that photo, which we quickly scrambled back down again. But no, she <laughs> actually played the standard hot metal lines, Chris. Yeah, which is really exciting for us and exciting for Japan as well. I know Erica isn't a, isn't necessarily the most well known name around the world yet, but she's been someone that we've been talking about internally within Mizuno for the last little bit to the point where actually she was in our last ST driver video as well. Um, she just won got a big win last week at the Japan uh, Japan Women's Open, so that's huge news. And it was and she's actually just and she's just twenty she's just twenty one years old as well. Yeah, she's very young and she's she's a great player. And I believe it was her first tournament with the new irons as well, which is something that's really cool. And, you know, it's it's, it's <clears throat> uncommon for us to have um, like a hot metal in the in a full bag like this. And the fact that she saw them and it speaks a little bit to the feel, the performance, and the consistency of it that she put these straight in and, and got a win right away. So I was going to come back to Fred, Fred, because we, we set you a bit of a challenge, didn't we? Which was almost to try and figure out what was the, the largest, most helpful club you could stand to look at and put in play. So you, we'll come back to that because we've been experimenting. But when you, when you see a, like an absolute top level play like Erica, does that not make you question some of the things that we do when we make our choices? Oh, 100%. I mean, even in the tournaments that I play now, a lot of players are gravitating towards easier clubs or uh, more forgiving clubs because you know you don't really see blades in most players um, bags anymore so when I just did some initial testing here with the tours the forged and the hot metals the forged worked the best for me and I, I wouldn't have guessed that you know I would have thought obviously I'm gonna play the tours you know I'm pretty good at this but uh, the forged worked fantastic and uh, um, I mean, I hit the hot metal and it was also pretty darn good. I mean, maybe a little bit too low spin for me, but uh, I was still surprised to, I mean, how, how easy they were to hit. And I think uh, a lot of pros now, they let go of their pride and they play more forgiving clubs. One thing that what I think, you, what, oh, good. Uh, well, I was going to say, Jay, what Jay mentioned earlier, I think is really telling where your question of, are people willing to go outside of what they're looking for in terms of, you know, everyone wants a muscle bag, everyone wants something sexy in the bag. But now that there's so many tools on the fitting side, you know, Fred immediately went to, well, these were the best because of the numbers, not because they look the best. Now that there's so many numbers involved in fitting, I think it's really changing what a better player will play because it's now very quantifiable in terms of what's performing better. When, if you go back, you know, a number of years ago, before the when when launch monitors weren't as prevalent and easy to get access to, I think players tended to lean towards what looked the sexiest. Now it's like, well, okay, I'll play those in certain clubs, but I can see these tangible and measurable benefits from more forgiving golf clubs. And I think you've seen it work its way. What started as game improvement clubs are now working for everybody at all different levels. That's so spot on. I couldn't have said it better myself. That's so spot on. Jay, any thoughts on that? I, my testing mainly when it comes to sort of the general public is that the amount of help that they need, especially when they get that shaft a little bit longer. 
Um, they might be able to strike it quite well when it comes to the, the shorter clubs, but especially when that shaft gets longer and their strike starts moving around, especially putting something like the Hot Metal, Hot Metal Pro. Um, I mean, even in the better players' hands, having the forged in there and resisting going to a tour a little bit later on, not going to sort of like into an eight, nine pitching wedge rather than sort of going into a six or a seven into a tour, uh, using that slight bit help more of forgiveness. Why, why would you not? Why would you give that up? Why would you not take every single little piece of help when this game does its best to take it away? Matt, are you going to have uh, any players looking at slightly larger clubs? I know you've, you've dabbled with something bigger, haven't you? Yeah, I think it's different. It's difficult for us. I mean, uh, I mean, Vosh is again touching about that. Really, the golf club itself at, at tour level, it yes, it has to tick the looks box and it has to look good and feel good, but every club in the bag has to serve a purpose, you know, and if it does, then it's in the bag. That's it. There's no, no um, bells and whistles that go with it. If it performs, it looks good, it's in the bag. So whether that be uh, a hot metal, whether that be the blade, <clears throat> everything in between, uh, there's, there's far less um, thought that goes into it, I think, at tour level, because if you put it down, you put a track man behind them, they hit the shot and they like the bullfight, then that's it. Done. Tick box. I can play golf with that, you know, so... I think the uh, the element of um, uh, what's the word uh, having to drum it into these people that this is the best thing for you is far easier at all because you go there's the facts and they go yep I can play golf and that's that's it so it is two very different worlds I think. But what was what's the largest or most game improvement set you've put in play in the last year? Uh, so so Matt Ford actually plays Planet Tour. He's a, a, a very very good golfer. He shot he shot ten under to win the other day. You know, so he's a he's a proper golfer, uh, and he's just put four to wedge in of the forged. So they'd be the uh, they'd be the, uh, the closest to the up up the hierarchy if you like to hot metal. But the um, yeah the forged are the biggest we've got if you like. Well, just mind your sound there, Matt. We just lose, you're just cutting in and out a little bit. Sorry, am I good there? Yeah, much much better. Just 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 the last twenty seconds again. So, uh, so Matt Ford. So he he plays Challenge Tour. Um, uh, he shot ten under round. Uh, where did he shoot ten under? He shot ten under round Cuttington in a regional event, um, and and won that obviously quite comfortably. So a very good golfer. Uh, used competitive brand until about uh, a month, two months ago. He put the new forged in, um, and that's that's our kind of biggest. Um, game improver if you like that's uh, as as high up the hierarchy as we've got at the moment at the moment I, I, yes. seem, to, I seem to remember was it I'm not sure how many names we can use but a, a, a way back we had a couple of guys who were using larger stuff I think it might have been Jeeve Milka Singh a long time ago was one of, yeah, was one of the kind of odd ones out yeah. yeah I think he was using from different uh, some different stuff but it's it's strange at retail versus tour. You don't have to persuade them so much. You know, I think you spend more time at retail persuading people to to try and put something a little bit easier to use in the bag. Whereas at tour, if if you're out on the range and and you they hit it better, then that's it. There's no there's no real kind of getting them over the line. If the product performs, then the product performs. And I think just that 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 middle slot there, um, Chris, that picture of Erica there, that was uh, her kind of welcome celebration back at the Mizuno HQ. It's quite a fun video out on Twitter, isn't it? From Mizuno Golf no. Japan Twitter account. Yeah, they had that scheduled even before she got the win, which was just perfect timing. So it's, I think it's pretty exciting and a cool thing to watch if you haven't yet. But, but yeah, perfect storm in Japan. So again, the ladies tour in Japan is huge, right? It's massive. It's, it's unbelievable. And I, I feel like it's something that I respect out of the, the Japan market is the level of club knowledge and the understanding of specs and head speed and what you need to, what you need to bring to the table to play a certain club and to play certain shots. I believe the Japan market's a little bit more evolved than the Western world market. And as a result, a lot of players, men and ladies look towards the, the ladies golfers to understand what they should be playing and what's more suitable to their game. Interesting. So back to, some very important club choices, Chris. These ones being your, your own. So, what, is this what you expected to set up? So you, you, you have a hand in developing the product. So as these things are being developed, do you already, have you started to formulate your own bag for the following season? Uh, I'd say 
what's funny is I'm I'm not a tinkerer. When I first started with Mizuno and was first able to have access to all this world of equipment, I started, I was someone who the, the second something new came out, it went in the bag and I was playing everything. And ultimately I, I've slowed down on that in recent years. So with that in mind, I, you know, I think Matt made a great point of every club has to serve a specific purpose. I don't want to put it in because it's something new. I want to put it in because it does something different. So obviously I've played the JPX tour for the last couple of generations. They were products that um, I had my hand in very heavily in terms of the development of, as well as the direction of taking JPX down that line. So I almost had a little bit of ownership over those products. So I love seeing where that product has evolved and how it's grown up and how it's matured through its multiple generations. So the first time I saw a 921 tour, I was excited about it. You know, it's something that I really wanted to play and I knew what it does and what are the design goals in terms of what it's supposed to do performance wise. So I knew they would slot into the bag very easily. What goes on the long iron end, that's been something that's been a little bit tricky from my end where I've played, I started playing a, a split set. This is going to go back a long time ago, back to the MX 900, which was one of the very first hollow body irons that Mizuno did. And that was a golf club that the it was just undeniable how easy the long irons were to hit. So the 900s went in on a 3-4, and I believe I had a 5 iron in at some point. But as, as those have evolved, you know, I'm always looking for irons that go a certain distance, not necessarily that go the longest distance. So I haven't always been up to date with what's in the top end of the bag. I played those for a while. I played MP fly highs for a little while. And then I played the MPH5 for the longest time. And actually the H5 is what was in the bag until just recently when I built up this whole set of JPEX tours combining with the HMDs. And the HMDs have been fantastic, what I've been able to do with those. And the way I set up my specs is a little bit different as well, where I know there's always a tricky part of how do you combine some of these sets when lofts become an issue. So it's the, my lofts are very traditional, except my five iron loft is tweaked. So it's like you had to find a way to bridge that gap in. So I'm excited about and the new set that I have, and I've been playing it for a couple three weeks now and have been very pleased with everything in there. So just, just quickly describe this set again, Chris, and tell me what you've done with that five iron. Yeah, so the JPX tours have very traditional lofts where the seven iron, I believe, is 34 degrees, which means the six iron is 30 degrees. Then the five iron goes to 27 degrees. However, if you look at the hot metal or the HMBs, excuse me, they're a little bit on the stronger side where the three iron is 19, the four is 22, the five is, I believe, 25. So if I were to just go four iron at 22 degrees to a six, to a five iron at 27 degrees, quickly I have a five degree gap in there. So I actually took the, the JPEX tour and bent it a degree stronger. So now I actually have exactly four degrees starting at the four iron all the way down to the 46 degree pitching wedge. So that's gonna help bridge the gap there. My three iron is only 19, so it's not quite four degrees, but I put a lighter weight shaft in my three iron to help gain that distance back. So it's still, the, the distance capping is right, even though the lofting isn't quite the same or isn't quite on paper exactly what you want. So I was able to dial in a set where every one is very, very well spaced in between them. And then I got, so I got those and then some T20 wedges. And then obviously my uh, ST190, which is in need of some replacements on the fairway woods. And my you ST200. don't like to change those fairway woods, do you? Those fairway woods stay in your bag a while. They, those were the first ones that replaced MX700, which was ages ago. So I've been very happy with those. And I, again, fairway wood is one of those clubs where when it works, it works. I don't mess with it much. Okay, so let's go on to another, another Mizuno set. So this is, um, this is an interesting one. The guy that works on the tour van. Uh, so talk me through your set, Matt. Uh, well, I, I again touching on uh, on that. The loft uh, lofts are kind of specific to the head design. So you know the distance is sometimes a little bit misinterpreted that it's just just done by loft. You know if you've got a, a slightly hotter head, if you've got a, a head that's designed a little bit more for distance, then obviously you need to take that into consideration. So. Uh, as Chris has said there with his, with his 19 degree 3 iron being 
a little closer to his forearm. Yes, on paper, that's the case, but but golf's played dynamically, right? So it doesn't matter to a point what's written down. It's all about, you know, what happens when you hit the shot. So uh, so I'm, I'm fairly similar, but I have, uh, I've weakened my HMBs the other way. So I've, I've got the tours at uh, traditional loft. So they are just bang standard in their loft right the way through. But I've weakened my HMBs to one week of um, tour standard just to match that in because they're because of the nature of the head they're slightly hotter the ball comes out a little quicker and it does go a little further so to gain uh, the consistency through the set i've just tweaked them where i needed to uh, and ended up at that working very nicely for me and they look suspiciously new as well matt uh well the tours obviously are yeah the tours are the tours are how long have i had those start of august perhaps um and HMBs actually have, have remained from my previous set. So the four and the five HMB um, are a season old, and then the the five to uh, sorry the six to wedge are a new addition. So when when the tours were first spotted, there wasn't I, I did, they didn't kind of get that super hot reaction that sometimes we get for a product. So a lot of the attention was more on the forge this time, but I've noticed them creeping into more bags. It's just yeah. it's a very very functional golf club covers a lot of bases. Yeah, the tours you mean? Yeah, yeah. The, the thing for me, the tours, the tours are two different clubs. You have a, you have the tours at Shelf Appeal, and then you have the tours down at Address, and they 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 almost look like two very different golf clubs because down at Address you go, oh wow, you know they're they're a really individual, very very uh, sexy look. Whereas at a, at Shelf Appeal, you know, up in the air, you go, okay, not too dissimilar from um, nine hundred, not too dissimilar from nine one nine. You know that nice smooth evolution of the of the the head. But it's when you put them down behind the ball. That's where I really fell in love with them. Uh, Chris, what do you what do you think of Matt's bag there? You I think it's a, very, it's a very similar setup. I believe it looks like you only go to the four iron where you you take that week and then you bring the hybrid in. I know that's you've it. got a lot, you've got a lot more head speed than I do, so I I go I go to actually to a five wood instead. But I think the setup it makes a lot of sense. Um, and then one thing that does different is he's got four wedges, including a set matching pitching wedge. And I know I actually have the T20 pitching wedge and only three wedges. So again, it just shows how many different ways there are to combine what looks like actually the exact same setup of HMBs, tours, and T20s. Ours are very, very different specs dialed into what we're looking to do. Yeah, yeah. And I, well, I'll mention this, maybe, maybe we might edit this question out, but you've, you've been hitting a new driver as well, Matt which you've obviously yeah. strategically taken out of the face, eh? Yeah. So that's, uh, I mean, if you said to me right now, go and play golf, that's what I would use. You know, I haven't quite figured out the driver just yet. I need to do some little more bits with it because, uh, again, just because of the nature of the head, it's not It's not a case of, uh, right, I'll, I'll, I'll take that head out of my previous shaft, put the new head on and, and get going. You know, it does feel different. It, it is a, a slightly different driver. So, Likewise, with everything in the bag, as again, as Chris has already said, if it, it, unless it's better, unless it's going to do a job that, that that one doesn't, then it's difficult to 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 put it in. But that's just a case of of uh, trying different things and 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 dialing it in. So that will come. But yeah, I just thought I'd take a picture of what I'd actually go and play golf with if I was playing <laughs> this evening. Mm -hmm. So then, I just sort of cover the bases and let everyone have their have their own couple of slides. So Jay, this is. You might have put together one of the most technical product tests we've seen in a number of years, or probably ever, with your um, latest JPX 921 reviews. So this was like almost the, the more expected part of the test. These are, these are your results of all the kind of the normal parameters, launch speed, peak height, descent angle, carry. Just, just talk yeah. us through your findings on that and what was the biggest surprise or did they meet exactly what you thought was going to happen? Um, um, well... When it comes sorry, to was that Jay or Matt, sorry. Jay, that was a Jay one. Sorry. Cool. Uh, when it comes to like the marketing gump, um, you read it and you kind of I put it to one side to to a certain extent, and then just hit it myself and see what I find. Um, and I'm not really a massive fan of sort of trying to get an iron as far as it can go. Um, I'm much more into making it functional. Uh, so when I started hitting the 921s, um, I was, especially the hot metals, I was a fan of the 900 hot metal when that came in. The first thing that I noticed when I hit the 900 hot metal, it just went 
poof, to the moon. And it was such a nice, easy club to get uh, up in the air. So then just sort of putting this, uh, I was just going to do the 91 and 919, but then had a sort of certain amount of requests for 900 as well. And I thought, yeah, this video is going to be a longer one. Um, but then that in and yeah, I, what I was surprised over more is that, yes, there's more ball speed from the 921, but it's, it's done in a, it seems to, for me anyway, it seems to sort of derive a certain ball flight, which is different to what I would normally think. It's not something that's going massively longer, but for me, it's something, especially in the hot metals, uh, and it's a trend with the other ones as well, is the fact that how much higher it goes and how much more stopping power it has. And even though it's a fraction longer, but not by much, it's so much more functional. Um, and when I'm custom fitting people which don't have a great deal amount of swing speed, having the ability to get the ball up in the air carrying and also stopping the other side gives them so much more control when it comes to trying to hit uh, target and stop it on the greens. Chris, anything you like in those numbers? I mean, these numbers, and for those who haven't watched the video, I fully encourage you to. This, the hot metal down the right side on the 900 was a six iron. So you got to kind of extrapolate that down to the seven that the other two were. But the numbers dictate exactly what we were trying to do. You know, the, the interesting thing is as golf clubs have gotten so strong and, you know, the, the game improvement side or the bigger headed side is the perfect example of where they've gotten stronger and stronger and stronger. We've seen a tendency for actual ball flights going into desired flight windows to land properly into greens has kind of been put beside how, just how far it goes, like almost put behind it, which as Mizuno, as a company that makes great irons and really wants performance out of all their irons, is something that's not right. So one great thing about this and what I love the most and when you're comparing these 921s to the 919s is the 921s are a degree stronger. However, they're launching higher and spinning more. So to get distance in a higher flight that lands steeper is, is exactly what we're trying to do. It shows that there's technology going on. It shows that the center of gravity is where it needs to be, the sweet spot's where it needs to be. And it shows we're not just chasing a launch monitor war of what has the fastest ball speed and what goes the farthest. I, supp I suppose that that's what gives them the potential to go in Erica's bag and actually be used to, used to play scoring golf. Absolutely. Because if, you know, if we're delivering a golf club, a seven iron with 5,500 RPM or something like that, when, when a tour player is playing on firm conditions, tough, tough, uh, you know, out of heavy rough and stuff like that, you get very unpredictable, unplayable things. That's why you need a certain spin rate out of a, out of a seven iron to be able to hold a green and also to be able to perform out of the rough. So it absolutely has helped us to get more, what would, you know, traditionally be viewed as game improvement irons into lower handicap bags. So I'm going to go down one. So it gets even more detailed, doesn't it, Jay? So you tried yeah, something very different. You tried to show forgiveness in numbers, which is something we haven't seen, I don't think, in the testing world before, not outside of internal testing. No, well, I won't go into massive detail about how this was created because it's massively long-winded. Um, <laughs> but basically, um, this is not all the data I've created up on the screen there. It's not just my data. Um, lucky enough, especially with the 900 and the 919 series and other clubs as well, um, I'm lucky enough that I've gathered an encyclopedia full of different people's deliveries during different sessions and all that. So what I decided to do was get all that data and look for traits when it comes to taking outliers out. So when someone's not delivering the correct uh, side dynamic loft or they're swinging at different speeds, um, you've got to try and keep the physically, the, the how they want to desire. So obviously some people want to cut it, some people want to draw it, and some people want to hit a, a straight shot. So as long as you've got a face angle to do a, a desired path, um, as long as the dynamic loft is there, and that that's the, when you can actually capture that as, as a relevant piece of information. So you're measuring just the strike. So I've gone through the whole lot of I don't know how much, and it did take a lot of work. But what you can create is basically this. You can get, as you see, effective drop-off depending on where you're going to hit it uh, on the screen. I know, of course, that is a generalized view of certain locations. You can get 
are infinite pinpricks of different points where mm -hmm. it drops off. But it gives people an idea, especially if they know their traits, if they know their patterns of where they're missing. Um, they can then potentially use this information when they're looking at uh, reviews online to see what kind of golf club may suit them. And this, this is on your, what's your YouTube channel again, Jay, just for everybody who wants to go watch the full, the full session? Um, it's Ask Golf Nut, all one word. So Chris, this, this isn't a million miles away from some internal data that we have, correct? No, so we love to talk about ball speed retention and the phrase we use is trying to develop a large core area. You know, COR or, or ball speed off of a given head speed is something that the whole industry talks about. But core area really refers to how big of the face is hot and how quickly does that COR drop off. And that comes from a number of different things. It comes from face design. It comes from moment of inertia. It comes from construction. It comes from material. It comes from how the face interacts with the, the top line, the sole, the toe. Even though it drops off quickly towards the sole side, if you can get the sole side engaged in that impact it makes that trampoline essentially play larger and it makes that efficiency number go up so this is very similar to something that we do i know jay had to struggle with a million different people hitting a million different shots and filtering out numbers we have our robotic golfer but we basically measure the exact same thing where we're, we'll measure impact center first. impacts we'll measure toe heel up and down and just have the robot do that and then dial in what is the efficiency and what's the ball speed drop off because it's it's vastly important when a golf club is designed to go a specific distance that it can continues to get predictable launch conditions and predictable ball speeds regardless of impact location and the numbers that jay's tests spat out are they align closely with your internal testing they absolutely line up with it you know it, it speaks to a little bit of how the head works and how the stability frame on the backside works in terms of where it's weighted and where the mass is so the stability frame and the moi in the up down direction is actually increased in the jpx 921 and you can see in the up down directions from the center impact you can see more efficiency more consistent ball speeds the slightly toe hit is actually better on the 921, which you can see. And always the drop off towards the heel, because essentially you can see that the, the heel gets smaller. So the trampoline is smaller in that area. You always see a quicker drop off in the heel area than you will on the toe. But those are things we try to dial in with our face design, with our core tech, to try to minimize that drop off and to give you as much efficiency out of a larger area on the face as possible. So Jay, does that, does that make it more fulfilling that you found out Chris already had all that data or does that just hurt? I was about to say, you could have given me the information before I had to do all that. <laughs> uh, I was just sort of wondering also as well, because obviously the JPX 921 is more forgiving from the toe. How much difference does it actually make? Obviously, because there is um, rotation going through uh, the hitting area of the head as it rotates through. So the yep. head, so the, the toe is obviously traveling faster than the, the center. How much difference does that make when you're, when you're moving away from effective middle? Obviously, when you're going towards the heel, yes, there's smaller trampoline effect, but it's also obviously the heel is traveling slower. Um, right. So how much how much difference, and that's that's one thing that I might have to do again, try and remap everything to try and take into account how much increase in ball speed potentially is happening from a miss hit off the toe. Um, you know, it's it's tough to put a put a solid number to that because there's so many things involved. I mean, I'll I'll say this in terms of like raw speed, in terms of how much it how much faster it's moving on the toe side than the heel side. I can speak to a test we did. Granted, this was a driver test a little bit before where we measured a heel head speed and a toe head speed. And on the driver test, you could see as much as five to seven miles per hour difference in just raw head speed between different portions of the club. An iron is going to be a little bit less than that just because the overall, you know, the arc isn't as large. The, the difference in space between the heel and the toe isn't as large. Yeah. But in terms of the actual speed delivered to the ball, a lot of things play into that. The toe is traveling faster than the heel. Yes. The trampoline is larger on the toe than the heel. 
Yes. And on top of that, the overall moment of inertia about the shaft axis is going to dictate some things. So in terms of how much rotation, that rotational force is traveling quicker across the toe as well. And the MOI is going to help increase that. So that's why, you know, there's a number of things that play into the retention better on the toe side than it is on the heel side. But ultimately, like one thing that we've seen a ton in the industry when we do this mapping, not just with our internal heads, but compared to our competitors, is a quest for center ball speed with a quick drop off. So it's like, if you could do something to maximize the head speed in the middle, so we can quote, this is the highest COR iron we've ever had. You know, that's a sexy quote, but does that play out on the course? That's a whole different thing. We're actually our thickest area of the club on the 921 is a larger, thicker area than it was before, meaning that we're we actually dialed back slightly a potential center ball speed so that we could have more efficiency on the toe, so that you have a more predictable difference on the toe. So those are some of the changes and some of the iterative things that we learn and that we continue to test and evolve in the designs. More consistent face, yeah. Correct. Matt, does any of that make sense? He's gone. Matt, are you on mute by any I, chance? Uh, or I put him to sleep. <laughs> you, you Sorry, know. no, I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm listening intently. Come on, Matt. So give, give, give me your reaction to all this stat and analysis. Uh, well, I mean, it, there's two ways you can look at that. You can look at it from a, 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 a spreadsheet kind of factual element, and then you can take that to the range. You can see what happens with the range. And obviously, I mean, miss strikes happen. That's, that's a given. That's golf. But players we deal with, if, if you're missing it in the toe or you're missing it in the heel or wherever you're missing it, it's going to be a bad shot. <laughs> that's the end of the day. That, that's going to, it's going to be a bad shot. So it's how it's kind of pinpointing the player that you're working with and understanding how much that negative shot is going to impact them. Because if you're playing off 12 or 14 and you're hitting a, a slightly less negative shot off the toe, then you can play with it. But if you're working with a tour player who hits one out so he's going to go oh, well, that's going to happen one in 40 goes so I'm not too bothered by it you know so it depends how how interested the individual is with seeing that bad shot because the 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 elite golfers tend to find the middle a bit more often than the uh, the higher handicappers so it's dealing with the individual and seeing how much of an effect that makes on the individual and distance control being a really massive factor out on tour maybe even I guess that's one thing you yeah. talk about almost more than left and right, correct, when you're working with these guys? Big time, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if they've hit it left or right, it's, it's, it's goal swing. You know, that's, that's them not coming into it clean. That's not coming into it clean. I mean, we're talking irons here. I mean, woods are slightly different, but irons, yeah, if they've hit a bad shot, they've hit a bad shot. It's not necessarily the golf club's fault. <laughs> I think they'll probably go searching for the coach before the clubs, um, whereas the, the consistency and the... Um, uh, how often the good one comes to the surface is what the what the, the elite guys are looking for. So I, I whizzed through the, um, we're talk, talking about who plays what and breaking down how a set is put together, Chris. So I just I just quickly went through earlier and, and pumped in some, some data, an average 10 handicap guy, just happens to be me. So this is all on the website. We, we might cut this out of the, the film edit, but I just whizzed through quickly. So I played myself off 10, I chose the best balance iron and outcomes JPX 9214, which I'm really pleased with because that's that'd be the iron that I'd choose if I had all three in front of me right now. And it's also the one that Fred got on best with. Fred, so you've just been doing a little bit of testing and your data doesn't go quite as deep as that, but you did have a load of data and you've got your, on that shot there, we can see you're holding the iron, but also the results up on the top right. So talk to me about how you got on with that forge and what surprised you. Yeah, uh, it's not as advanced as these guys, that's for sure. <laughs> well, you're, a, you're, a, you're a field guy with technology. You probably, you're falling somewhere in those two camps, aren't you? Yeah, no, uh, I mean, the biggest thing is that obviously it has to feel good. But for me, it's all about what iron can I control the flight the best with. So uh, uh, most often when you have a, um, a bigger iron or a more forgiving iron, it's harder to kind of work it. Uh, in, I mean, in my opinion, uh, maybe because the spin is lower and so on, and it's more stable, obviously. But with the force club, I could really hit that little fade, which is my uh, stock shot. So it was very simple for me to kind of fade it, 
which is something that I really like. I know, especially when I'm under pressure during tournaments, I like to hit a bigger fade. That's just my stock shot. So um, the hot metal uh, iron, that went a little bit too straight for me. And uh, I felt like I almost lost too much distance with the tour head when I tried to fade it. But for the, me, the forged head really worked great for to hit a little bit of a uh, sawed off shot, uh, fall into the right. And uh, yeah, for me, it felt great. And the numbers, the numbers really show that it was great too. It didn't spin too much when I hit the little fade. So for me, it was perfect. And you're going to take these out of the course soon or you've been filming already? No, I actually been uh, filming and already taking out, taking them out a couple of times. Uh, it was really interesting to see how they perform out of the rough, you know. So can I get enough spin from the rough? Because uh, we don't always hit the fairway, so we got to make sure we can stop it on the greens. With the ball is not coming out with not enough uh, spin out of the thicker lies, and uh, it's performed. Uh, pretty darn good so far i'm definitely gonna come out with a video where i bring out the trackman and i and i try it out also with some wet conditions and so on um but yeah it's it's worth the force is definitely is the front runner uh, so far and uh, but we'll see if i make it a combo set if i can get the tour in some of the lower irons and or higher irons what do you say from like pitch and wedge to seven iron and then maybe get the force from there but i don't know as of right now even the nine iron feels pretty good with the forged head so that kind of takes us into the next part of the conversation chris so now we're on to how you split these sets so we kind of in a roundabout way we've talked about all the different models now now so the forge is an interesting one because so, some people have, have recently discovered so we, we didn't make it 100 percent clear first off the bat that the irons are chromoly through to the seven iron, correct, Chris? The first ever forged one piece, full body chromoly forged iron. But eight to pitching wedge, it's a gap wedge actually. They're quite slim line and they're actually um, the 1025 EPS of select mod carbon steel. Is that right? That's absolutely right. So it's almost like it's, it's almost a pre built combo set to some extent because some of the things we did design wise, there is the material change where on the longer irons where they're designed to go a little bit further, be a little bit higher launching. We did go with a stronger material, which is that chromoly. And then on the scoring irons, the eight, nine pitch and gap, they got slimmer in their profile. They got slim, uh, slimmer top line, slimmer sole, but also a change in material to the 1025E, which is what we use on the tours, as well as a lot of the MP line, our muscle backs, the MP20s use that. So it's almost like it's quasi a, uh, split set to begin with that being said you know they're all tied in together into one set and then you have other opportunities in terms of how you can mix them with other clubs as well so do you think we've we've become a little bit too obsessed with set mixing and because it's, it's something that really came around with the mpi so i'm just throwing up some bits on the website now as we're talking mm -hmm. the, the mps kind of set the tone didn't they for set splitting it's definitely changed the thinking from the design side. You know, MP18 was really the first time where we designed not just one set individually, but all of the sets at once. And what I mean by that is they were designed to be a seamless transition regardless of where you made the break. So it's easy to get stuck on a spreadsheet when you're designing saying, well, the tours are this big, the forge need to be this big, the hot metals need to be this big, and just draw very clear lines. But the way fitters work and the way players are being fit into clubs now, you see these transitions all the time. So what you got to try to do now is actually don't look at the set design as, well, I'm working on this set today. It's I'm working on this part of an overarching family. So with the specs and how, how they look at a dress, how the head shapes flow, how the specs flow, the head length, the offset, the sole width, you're now looking at how can this whole set flow together as one, regardless of where you make that break, even if you're talking a hot metal combined with a tour, like something that's a very extreme combo, it happens. So I think we've taken it to a whole nother level. And I'd argue we've taken it a lot farther than anybody else in the industry has too, in terms of literally encouraging you to make these, uh, make these combo sets. But ultimately for every club to have its intended purpose, 
that's how it needs to be because not everybody needs that forgiveness starting at the five iron or at the seven iron or at the three iron. It all depends on the player. So this particular chart I threw up was really coming off the back of the conversation with Fred a moment ago, which is, so Fred's talking about potentially splitting a set of forged and tour because mm -hmm. probably that's what you, you, you as, a, as a better player, that's what your mind is telling you to do. So you've tested the forge has gone really well, but somewhere in the back of your mind, you're hanging on to this idea that you should be playing tour irons in the, in the uh, eight, nine pitch. But actually the chart here, and anyone can go and check this out on the website and you can compare any two or sure. all the models together. But actually the real difference there is on that longer end, correct? Is that as it's getting closer to pitching wedge, whether it's head length, sole width, offset, we, these clubs are getting closer and closer to being the same club. That's absolutely right. So um, one thing that I hate about the scale of this is if you throw a hot metal on, you see how these look like they're miles apart and they're not because the scale has actually stretched them up to fill the screen. But you're right, they're, they're not miles apart, especially when you're in the scoring irons. And that was one thing we did on the forge was the scoring irons got very, very small. So that means where wherever you decide to make the break, you're able to have a good transition between those. But I totally encourage people who are thinking about comboing sets, throw all these together and try to understand where the offset changes are going to be and what that's going to mean. And then in terms of the loft, that's what something you have to dial in too, because if you were to change the lofts, for example, I know Matt talked about him taking his HMBs weaker. When you take a club weaker, that reduces offset as well. So that actually brings these lines even closer together. Hmm. Okay, so I think we're going to get more into the out the deep day and also just to show you again, so you can do that with the JPX, you can do that with MP20. So just again, it's it's just just worth having a play with this. I'll probably edit this out of the video, um, but the, the tools are there for people to have a play with. Now, at some point when you're doing a fit in, this is almost like one of the final screens, right, Chris? So this this has been taken from the fit in software that all of our retailers use. So yep. once you've gone through the fit in, so people have essentially gone to the center, they fit their seven iron, we figured out which seven iron works best. Hopefully before you go for the fit in, you've got some base level of understanding about what these different models do, where they're particularly different and where they're closer to being the same. It is a little bit difficult because you can't test the four iron versus the four iron, the pitching wedge versus the pitching wedge. So we're gonna get into a little bit of guidance for people, but essentially everyone hits, hits this point. What's wrong with just going for a complete set at this stage? It all depends on the player. I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with going with a complete set, but sometimes you'll be sacrificing on one end, one end of the bag or the other. So one thing that this does that I'm, I'm sure Jay does when he's going through a fitting is try to understand at what point are you going to begin to struggle maintaining loft gapping or maintaining lift that you need for a certain iron. So. I don't, again, I don't think anything's wrong with going straight with a full set, but sometimes you could get a little bit more out of that set or more out of certain clubs by, by potentially combining with something else. Do you hit this point, Jay, within a fitting? And is, it, is this where it gets complicated for you or is this a pretty easy flow? No, this is the uh, this is day to day stuff. This is um, so basically whenever I do the, uh, the fitting side of things, I get, I look for a point of diminishing returns. So necessarily just by taking loft off, um, you're not going to carry the golf ball um, necessarily any further. So that's when you need to look at potentially going to something which is a little bit more helpful, something which is designed to get the ball up carrying um, a bit higher, and then you'll get that separation again. Um, so whether that will run into um, going from, say, um, a blade um, into a bit more sort of a MP20 to a HMB, or if you're looking at like a tour into a forged into a, a hot metal pro, um, it can then just literally just be you go to your iron and then you have to stop and then you have to look into uh, a CLK or, or a fly high. How do you look at this, Matt, once you get to this point? I mean, obviously, you don't use the, the software as exhaustively out on tour. But how, how do you, when you've got the guy and you, you kind of, you know, roughly which, what's the core model, when do you start talking about splitting sets? Is that, is that something the player brings up or is it something you suggest? Yeah, splitting sets is always an interesting one for us because we uh, don't necessarily recommend it to start with. You know, I think uh, it depends whether you're looking at an iron set or a, a long iron replacement because I'd class the HMB as a, as a long iron replacement, you've got that down that end of the bag, maybe a two, three, four iron, maybe creeping into your five iron. But 
your hub of your set, let's say five iron to pitching wedge or gap wedge, wherever you want that set to be, um, our individual sets look after themselves so well now that there really isn't, through testing, there really isn't a uh, a need anymore. I think where the drop-off in the shorter irons happens and where the longer irons, you can see a little bit more of the back, which creates that element of um, forgiveness and ease of use. Unless, unless someone is saying, hmm, I don't like the job the six iron's doing, I don't like the job the seven iron's doing, okay, we can try and, we can try and change that to get a desired ball flight or a desired uh, trajectory or, or visuals. Then really, we just always start with a, a, a set, if you like, within a, within a family of irons. I think so, that's a really good point that Matt just made, is that a lot of these clubs are designed with a really nice flow to them and some sort of a, a thinking of comboing within the own, its own set to where when we first started with MP18, you saw lots of, call it three tier combos where you'd have a muscle back and then an SC and then an MMC and then maybe a fly high on top of that. We're at the point now where each set is so good. I, it's very uncommon that we'd recommend more than two sets within a combo where you, that used to not be the case because it's like the muscle backs were all designed just to be straight up hard to hit. Like it's not really the case anymore where there's a lot of flow. So typically the single, single transition is ideal now with how we've set everything up. So and I, then we touch the, carry on. Sorry, I was just going to say, we, we touched there, Chris, on, on you and I set, we've got, uh, a long iron replacement yeah, as such in our bags and then a and then a complete set and that's where i see sometimes this, the 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 word split set does get a little bit lost in in people's minds because a split set doesn't have to be as you say every every iron family we do oh, four iron five iron in this or six iron seven in that you know if you've got uh, a four iron in your bag that you know that you use it as a driving iron or you know you want to use it off the tee then that's that that's fine that's that that's that individual's club bosh tick that 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 box is ticked and then you move into a family of irons that feel and look identical and you've got you've got your your two um your two feels within an iron set that you want so it really, it really feels like so the, the evolution of this is much more long iron replacements and more of a mainstream iron set is maybe where it's evolving to but we still we still do get it the other way as well though chris don't we we get again fred's a great example where he's pretty much established the iron that works best for him, but he's really looking at that short end of the bag, wondering as a, as a better player if he can make a break at that end as well. So this is where it gets really complicated. <laughs> there are implications when you start splitting sets as well, right, Chris, because you've got lofts, you've got distance gaps. So if you are going to take that break and you're going to put it, for instance, let's have a look. So the, ch ch explain this data, Chris, because you'll do it better than I will. Yeah, this was a, uh, a nice little complicated spreadsheet I put together to just to try to put where we recommend some transitions. Because obviously, if you keep an entire set, you're going to have a nice little flow of, stop, of loss from top to bottom. However, when you start combining clubs with very traditional lofts versus very strong loft or what we call modern lofts as the kind of in between, there's going to be breaks in there. So, you know, a, a perfect example that I can show right now is, you know, there's four columns here and that's where you make the break. And when I, when I was discussing my set earlier, I talked about playing the tour with the H and B and the long iron. So I love to look at over on the right side column, the four to five transition, because that's what I do. I have a very, very traditional lofts in all of my clubs up to the five. And then I go to an H and B four iron. So what I do there is actually take the five and bent it one degree strong. So obviously the, the top row of this is what you have to do to manipulate the loft. The middle row is what that drives the loft to. And the bottom row is what now are your gaps between each one in terms of loft. So now you can see what that does. That puts you at four degrees everywhere and then three degrees from the three to the four, which is exactly my setup. And the whole thing is we want to be able to recommend because it has gotten very complicated. Where am I going to transition golf clubs and where am I going to make switches? Because at certain points, it's easier or harder to make that transition. You can see transitioning from the five to six is more complicated than transitioning from the four to the five. So on all these things, there's a lot to consider, but I want us to working with fitters, working with tour players, drive to something that ultimately is going to get the most performance out of a combo set for anybody. 
Matt, does, does, does that kind of sync in with some things that you do on the workshop there, that, that those where you make the breaks? Yeah, I mean, as a rule of thumb, it is so individual. There really isn't a uh, uh, a standard break. It, you know, we've had we've had some that have gone HMB through to eight iron, and then and then blade nine wedge. You know, really random things. But as long as you get out on the golf course and you get to where you want the ball to be, then it doesn't matter. You know, there really isn't a uh, you have to have four iron in this, or you you can't rule this out. That's where the sets, as you say, blend so nicely um, and and can match in loft-wise, then there really are no rules. And I bet Matt does a lot more bending weak. And I bet it, when Fred's looking at putting his set together, I bet he might bend towards the weak side. You see a lot of these are bending strong. And I think it all depends on the player. So what, what, was yeah. your, what, would mean, your, yeah, what would your rule be there then, Chris? For, if you could say yeah. anything to anyone out there. I'd say that's that's a little bit tricky because I think there's there's two types of players. Obviously, distance is sexy, so I think there's a lot of players who I think there's more players who prefer distance over look, which is sad to say, but I believe that's accurate. So I think that's why all of these, for the most part, are on the stronger side. However, for the better player, for the tour level player, for the guys Matt's dealing with, the girls Matt seals with. For Fred, I bet both of them prefer the look of less offset. And that's one of the big things that happens when you start messing with lofts and bending weak and strong. As you bend a club slightly stronger, you're actually adding offset to the club. However, if you're bending the club weaker, you're reducing offset, which is why I think you see a lot of tour players or really low handicappers bending weak, as opposed to I think you see the higher handicapper probably they don't care as much or don't notice as much about the offset and care more about how far it goes and they've been strong but the, the table you've put together here this is how you would do it by disrupting things like offset and and the leading edge the least is, is that correct that's correct and and for the most part they're all designed so that if you were to bend one model two degrees stronger it would actually line up with the loft of a non-bent of the stronger, for example, like the, that HMB, uh, ultimately because it is stronger, it starts with more offset. So right. basically, if you were to put an HMB at MP20 specs, it's going to have MP20 offset. Or if you take an MP20 and put it to HMB specs, it's going to have HMB offset. So ultimately, they're designed to mix and match like that. So you've done another example here for the JPX 921s as well. So this is in Fred's world now. So now we're talking about the tour and the forge together. Any, any differences here in how this is all put together? Is it, is it very much similar information? It's similar information, but you'll see a lot more bending weak in the forge because this isn't where the last one was taking in HMBs in the long iron. It was really doing like myself and Matt have done where we're putting more driving irons in the long iron side. This is just combining tour and forge, which ultimately the forge isn't necessarily a driving iron type golf club. That would be more either the hot metal or the HMB. So when you combine these, this is more putting together a more was more like a standard set. So on these, you see more bending on the weak side. And again, that's going to help line those offsets up there. Do, do, do you see your set in there somewhere, Fred? Does that look like something that might work for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I probably will put the forge all the way down to a five iron for sure. I like the look of a uh, longer iron that's a little bit easier to hit. I've been playing the HMBs in five four three and two and they work great i know chris mm -hmm. made them a little weaker for sure and um, mm -hmm. when he helped me out in atlanta when i got fitted for my irons but i just it's just comfortable man it's just sometimes it's very hard to hit a long iron some weeks and to have that little extra help in there and just give you a little extra confidence is something that i kind of enjoy so uh, i'm i'm definitely pro uh, well i can't say definitely but Right now, it looks like I'm for sure going to put the five iron in a forged model too. Jay, does, does all this help you in any way? Or is this kind of, for a regular fit, or this is all just kind of known that if you do a split set, you ask for adjusted loss at the time and you know exactly where to do it? Or is this, is this new information for you guys? 
No, I mean, yeah, the, the more you do it, the more you get this as, as just reactionary stuff. You just, um, you, you, you kind of just know what to bend in what area to make sure you keep the bounce and the offsets uh, very, very similar. So if you've got like two degrees and um, moving one way, one another way, one degree, one degree, depending on uh, what the player wants, you're not going to be moving too far off. But I mean, in my set that I've got still to test in there, I've actually got from um, the Fly High Hot Metal Pro forged and tore all in one bag <laughs> to see just how yeah blendable these can be it's been an interesting one jay hey, when you do when, when you have that conversation or do you have that conversation through the fitting do you let them know that you're going to have to do this or do you kind of let that happen behind the scenes and just let them know they're getting a combo set um, no, so basically we get to a set, I normally work it on sort of their ability for strike and also their ability to try and get the ball up in the air and, and, and have that effective distance. Um, as soon as they stop getting that effective um, gapping because of diminishing returns, that's when you start looking at different heads on sort of the different lofts of no heads, then you need to start looking at blending. Um, and that's when you have the conversations, especially with um, when it comes to the screen beforehand, we have the, um, the software side. So you just see all the, all the numbered irons and the lofts underneath. Then you say, well, these are this, this, this. We'll adjust this to here. So you've got your four degrees here. You've got your five degrees here. We'll move this. So we don't move your offset and you bounce too much on this. So, yeah, it's a very open conversation. And it's a conversation that we've got to have because they've got to understand what they're going to get. Nice. And then there's your final one, Chris, for someone who's really, really into the numbers. This is how you would blend three sets out of that 921 range. Yeah, this is where it gets really tricky because the tours are very traditional lofts and the Hot Metal and Hot Metal Pro, they're very strong lofts, to be honest. So it's, it's combining those becomes the most tricky. I mean, you can see actually the tour, uh, the tour four iron is 24 degrees where the, the hot metal pro or sorry the hot metal and hot metal pro six iron is only one degree weaker it's 25 degrees so when you're combining something like that it's very it's it's tricky and you got to understand what you're doing so the one thing that i'll always like to point out is i think one thing that's been brought up to us is we don't no longer have a two or three iron that two or three iron traditionally would have been 21 degrees which is actually weaker than the hot metal and hot metal pro four iron so it's like there's options in there in terms of understanding what's the sole number on your club versus what are you trying to do getting consistent distance gaps. So we've got so many great long iron replacements. And I think the Hot Metal and Hot Metal Pro are phenomenal hot metal or phenomenal long iron replacements for tours and forge. Essentially, we're going to take all this information and bundle it up and create a web tool that's going to make it easy for people to kind of come out with what the recommended combo set spec should be when it comes to loft and which adjustments they need to make. But just for today, while you had the raw information, it was nice to have you here to explain it. And if people want a screen grab, obviously you can have an advanced copy of the web tool to come. But before we finish that up, Matt, any, any kind of final tip from you in terms of if somebody's thinking of mixing a set, what, what would be your advice be to them? If a, friend, if a good friend rang you up and said they're thinking of mixing a couple of sets, what would your advice be to them? I would always say, and I, I, I say this in most fits we, we see, is you have to remember the job of each individual club. You have to remember what's stamped on the bottom of the club. So don't get fooled by, um, you know, uh, launch monitor fits where, you know, you walk away and you go, oh, my God, I hit my, I hit my six iron 210 yards. But that's, that's not really, uh, that's not functional. Yet. It's not a, not a set of golf clubs that you're going to take on the golf course and enjoy. So, it's very, uh, it is invaluable to have a, a set of bats, whether it be seven irons and two wedges, seven irons and three wedges. However you do it, every club has to do a job and every club has to, you have to stand on a par three and say, oh, you know, this is, this is a perfect five iron. This is a perfect eight iron. And if that's not the case, then, you know, you have to make exceptions for your equipment. Then I would, I would question the fit. So it tends to, sounds to me like you're recommending simplicity where possible. Totally, absolutely, and then, and you know, before before the change in in uh, our sets and our kind of um, mentality when designing sets, then that was the case, and you had to you had to break the sets, and you had to do different things with them because they didn't flow uh, like they do now. But 
people tend to overcomplicate everything and that's that goes with everything that goes with shaft fitting triangle fitting everything tends to be a little bit overcomplicated when actually look at ball flight get a nice feel and get a number that you want to hit each club and and you're halfway there so yeah i would as long as those boxes that you want to see are ticked then you're on the right lines jay any any advice from you before we sign out um, no, I mean, just when it comes to, I don't know how, uh, how Matt sees it or when it comes to obviously dealing with tour players, et cetera, as a day by day. But I mean, generally speaking, I'm dealing with from very good golfers down to beginner golfers. Um, and for me, when it comes to like uh, lie angle, et cetera, trying to get the right shaft and especially lie angle is invaluable because the, the better players, yeah, they don't have interaction with the big ball before the small ball. Um, but the, uh, the the worst of players or the, or the beginners or the mid-handicaps, they do have a tendency to hit the ground before. And so any issues with lie angle, toe deep or heel deep will have obviously face twist issues um, in there as well. So, um, yeah, it's and everyone's individual. And Fred, any, anything you've learned from all that or any, any thoughts you're going to take away for your next rep, bout of testing? Yeah, uh, listen to these guys. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Listen to the guys and know their stuff. So, uh, yeah, get get fitted. It's obviously super important. And uh, get fitted with guys and know their stuff like these guys. No doubt. Chris, I'm going to hit you up when I get back. <laughs> Absolutely. We're looking forward to having you back. It's been too long. Yeah, it has. Sure. So when, when can we see the next video then, Fred? When, when will that be live? Uh, in a, uh, next week. Okay, uh, look forward little, to seeing that. Yeah, yeah, I'm a little slower with the editing process, but uh, it, it will you, get you, there. It will be posted you, you, next you, week. You have some golf store to play as a pro as well, don't you? You're not, you're not just there for the YouTube stuff. You've actually got a, you've got a playing career still in front of you as well. So. Yeah, I, I hope so. Exactly. And you, had, <laughs> and you had a win recently. I did, yeah. It's a small, smaller uh, tournament here in uh, Sweden. I actually, I ran away with it. It was fantastic golf. Um, and uh, it was just one of those days where everything worked. So I'm super excited about that. So hopefully I can bring that uh, confident back to the States. Well, con congratulations on that, Fred. Nice to see you playing well. Um, so before you. we signed out, Matt, I just wanted to just remind you of Matt and Chris. So the, the, ne the next stage, really, the next set of things we'll be talking about will be, will be Woods, right? In the not too distant future. Damn straight. We're, we're, <laughs> we're very excited about some stuff that's being kind of teased here a little bit i know matt's been hitting these for a little bit and had some phenomenal numbers along with every test we've had about something something new that's coming from we've had some really good success with our st uh 190 and then st 200 and can look for that to be even taken to the next level so i can't so wait we, to show you what's under these so we, we know we, we've made some changes in the fact that it was kind of almost known that Mizuno tour players didn't always play Mizuno drivers. It almost became a, what was expected. So you've turned, we've turned that around really the last two, three seasons. So Matt, Matt, you've played a, you've played a pretty large role in that you, yourself and Alex on the workshop. Yeah. And then we've taken that. it one yeah. step further. We've taken it one step further just recently. We actually had a non-contracted player playing a Mizuno driver recently, Chris. Which is something that I don't remember the last time that happened. Yeah. We actually had a player who was, right near the lead until the last day uh, last week in the, in the States on the PJ Tour, non-contract guy who put it into play for the first time last week and actually got a uh, me text message from him earlier this week saying he needs a backup built because it's really, really good. So for us to not only have all the Mizuno players playing our clubs, but also some non-Mizuno players playing our driver, it's a different world with what we're doing on the wood side right now. So anyone who had immediately dismissed our woods just because of reputation or whatever they thought about a Mizuno wood, I encourage you to hit the new ones. They are going to surprise you. Anything to sum up there, Matt? I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I mean, we're, uh, we're in it for the long game now, you know, we're not just uh, dipping our toe in and, and making one and then going back to what we know, you know every year now is a, uh, is a, uh, a very nice step up from the year before. So, you know, it's a, uh, the, the future looks bright and, and everything we're doing at the moment is is a level up. So it's, uh, yeah, it's super fun to be part of and uh, and it would be exciting to get some stuff out. Good. Well, thanks for joining me, everybody. That was quite a long session. We'll see if we can break that into bits or we have a, a, a monster uh, broadcast out on YouTube. But appreciate all your input. I, I, I learned a little bit. So uh, 
hopefully we can turn that into some useful information for people. So we'll get back together in a, maybe in a couple of months, Chris, and do this again with another catch up. Sounds great. Good. All right, guys. Thanks for joining and uh, I'll catch up with you all soon. Cheers. Thank nice you. One. Thanks, guys. Cheers.